Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, delighted to have uh, Brian McVeigh back. We're looking at core ideas of Julian Jaynes. Um, and I was bowled over by the fact that Brian is writing a book that I wish was already out there. And that is about how do you apply Julian Jaynes ideas to your own life, to make your own life better for self-healing. So how, how do you use these ideas in your life? So Brian, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. So Brian, tell me about this book that, that so it's already with the printers? Yes, I uh, submitted it to the press about a month ago. So I'm not sure how long it'll take for it to come out, but of course, any news I'll report to uh, anyone who's interested. Wonderful. So tell, tell us about the book. What is it about? What is it called and what is it about? Uh, it's called, um, what is it called? Actually, I kept changing the title. It's um, The Self-Healing Mind, The Active Ingredients of Psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And what is it about? Well, I, uh, of course, use some ideas from Julian Jaynes. Uh, and I also use some ideas from positive psychology. Mm -hmm. And I also address what is called in the literature on counseling, common factors. And mm -hmm. perhaps we could talk about that a little bit later. But, uh, you know, just to be clear, Julian Jaynes never elaborated any theory on psychotherapeutics. However, in two or three places in his writings, he did uh, suggest that somebody should. <laughs> he did say that if we can theorize and understand the nature of consciousness, this can open up a lot of doors to understanding why the mind sometimes malfunctions. And not only that, but uh, even when the mind is working, what can we do to use certain features of consciousness to enhance mental health? Wonderful. Uh, let me remind everybody uh, here look, this is not TV, okay? This is a workshop. Uh, all, all our meetups are that. So you need tools. You need this, invented about 5,000 years ago. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, if, if you are not that tech savvy, you can use this. It's not as good as, as this one. It has a lot more flexibility. Um, so use it to keep track of all your ideas. We're gonna cover a lot of ground here, okay? Use it to keep track of your ideas, to organize the ideas. Immediately after this talk with Brian, we're going to go into this, uh, the breakout rooms. Look at your paper at that point and talk only about your deepest observations and deepest questions. Put them on the table. You'll have two minutes each to do that. And then you have a discussion about that. Make more notes, make deeper takeaways and questions, and then come back, talk about your takeaways, put your questions uh, to Brian. That's the way in which we can actually internalize these ideas. Okay, so with that, let me, uh, let's dive into this. So you start with a very interesting observation that the success rates for various types of psychotherapy are about the same and that there must be some other ingredient that must explain that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right, so uh, people who research this call it the dodo bird effect. And so if anyone's familiar with, if you've read your Alice in Wonderland, you'll know the story about how the dodo bird and some other animals had a race around the lake and there, there was there, there really no competition everybody ended up going around the lake. No one kept track of time or anything like that who won the race. And so the dodo bird was asked, well, uh, how do we decide who wins? And the dodo bird said, well, everyone gets prizes, everyone wins. And that seems to be the view of many researchers and clinicians about counseling, that it doesn't necessarily matter what particular school or intervention or technique, whether it's behavioralism or um, cognitive behavior therapy or narrative therapy, classical Freudian psychoanalytic approach. What's important are common factors or what I call active ingredients. And the claim I make in the book, what I try to work out is that 
Jane's offers us this common factor, consciousness. And so our task or my task is to figure out exactly what is consciousness and how can we use it as a common factor uh, to help the mind recover. And my thinking is that probably most clinicians use the common factor of consciousness or different aspects of consciousness, but they're not aware of it because I think the problem with consciousness, why people struggle with the notion is we take it for granted. It's like the nose on our face. We don't really know what it is because we use it all the time. And so my goal is to distill out the different aspects of consciousness and figure out how can we cultivate these features in order to help the mind heal. Wonderful. Um, so folks, I mean, so the first thing that you really need to grasp is this concept of consciousness. If you get that much, I think you've gotten a lot, okay? Because so many people use, use it to refer to so many different things. But Julian James means something specific. Now, for me, the first key towards this concept was to use the concept of mental space as a starting point. That you know you have this mental space which you insert between stimulus and response where you can do things. That's how I thought about it. But I I like the way in which Brian puts it. Uh, he uses the term conscious interiority. Could you talk about why conscious interiority? Well, I picked that term because, as you seem to be saying, the problem with the word consciousness, it has five or six completely different definitions in English. And it amazes me how people who should know better, PhDs, neuroscientists, whoever, use consciousness in such an ill-defined, vague, sloppy way. And so I wanted to come up with a term that still resonates with what Jane's meant by consciousness, but something different. And I picked conscious interiority. And so interiority is supposed to uh, denote the feeling that there's a sort of internalization or interiorization of the world into our heads. And so I use consciousness, conscious interiority interchangeably. But again, I did that specifically because the problem of the word consciousness in English is very misleading and it's very vague. Perfect. So for, from now on, let's just use conscious interiority. I actually like it very much because I used to use mental space before. But then what happens, and the value of using mental space is that it is so such a simple metaphor. You know, there is space and there is mental space. It's a very simple metaphor. The problem with the term is that then I have to say, you create the mental space, then you have this analog eye that is narratizing different possible routes in the mental space. So I have to describe all of that to talk about what this view is. But all of that can be captured under interiority, conscious interiority. So you are actually doing all these things internally. So instead of things happening outside, you are actually making that happen inside. You're kind of running, you're running a simulation of possibilities um, inside. Does, is, is that a fair way of describing it? Yes. Yes. Um, and one thing I try to do that I think is very important, and I would say to anyone who's genuinely interested in understanding what James was trying to do, go to his book, look on page 56 to 63, and he lists about half a dozen features of consciousness. And what I've tried to do is elaborate upon those features and I've expanded the list a bit to about a dozen features. And I call these features of conscious interiority, or for short, F-O-C-I, FOCI. <laughs> you know, uh, academics always like to put, thing in, put mm -hmm. things in acronyms. But if there's one thing that you take, that I hope you take away from today's discussion, it's that consciousness is a package of features. And it really doesn't make much sense unless we break down these features or functions of what consciousness can do. 
And Jane's, when he first listed, uh, actually, he eventually would expand it to about eight features. But in any case, for him, he said that this is just a starting point to figure out what consciousness is. This is just a way to talk about it. So it's very important to keep in mind that when we use the word conscious interiority, we're, it, that's shorthand. It's abbreviation for about uh, a dozen or so key processes that uh, that make up conscious interiority. Excellent. So let's do that. Let's not use the term consciousness anymore, uh, if we can avoid it. Um, and let's try to look at different features of conscious interiority. First, I want to first I want to compliment you on this writing of this blog post that I had. Uh, referred to in the meetup description. And folks, you should read it if you have not already read it. Uh, and if you have read it, please read it again, because there, there are several formulations which makes, which actually point to what this conscious interiority is better than I have seen it elsewhere. Okay. So first one you talk about, you say, what, what, is, what is James talking about? He's talking about a type of metacognition that is experienced as subjective, introspectable self-awareness. Right. I thought that was a very good way of, of describing it. So that was that is one formulation. The second formulation that you have is a description of foci. So foci are instances of adaptive reframing, abstracting, metaf metaphorizing, and transcending our circumstances. So it is a perspective on your, on your circumstances. So you're transcending them, you are metaphorizing them, you are abstracting, you are doing adaptive reframing. Uh, I thought that also was a very good description. So these both these ways, I mean, because what we are trying to do is that it is very difficult to communicate this concept because I have a referent inside my head and you have a referent inside your head. And what we are trying to do is that we are using these words so that both of us hopefully are thinking of the same, you know, equivalent things. Right, right. It is enormously diff more difficult than saying a table where we can all po both point to and we can both see it. Right. <laughs> So I, I, I thought these descriptions were great. So now what I want to do is I want to go through these 12, uh, 12 aspects. And even if we just did that, I think this would be a very good way of putting, you know, the, it would be a good way to start this series of saying, okay, what is conscious interiority? So let's go one by one mental space. So what, could you say a little bit more about mental space? Uh, Brian, don't, don't be shy about repeating things because what happens is that these concepts are so hard to get mm -hmm. that you the only way to actually communicate them is to repeat it many, many times in many, many different ways. And hopefully some of the formulations will stick in some somebody else. That's right. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, so the first feature of conscious interiority uh, something that we talked about a lot before, mental space. And so this is the belief, it's a belief that we have to learn that there is this virtual universe or world inside our head. And it's a, it sets up a stage where we can introspect, where we can see ourselves doing things in the future or in the past. Um, it's a place to fantasize. It's also a place to get worried uh, it, it, there's also some, uh, it can, even though it, uh, mental space is a very powerful adaptation of the human mind, uh, it, it also has its downside, like all these features do. But in any case, what's important about mental space is it gives us a location where we can manipulate things. Um, and it's, I think it's very difficult for most people to conceptualize that before about 1000 BCE, people could not do that. They could not envision or experience 
uh, mental sceneries. They could not use their mind's eye to uh, see a completely different uh, uh, universe. And, and the, sometimes I use the word psychoscape or uh, another word I use is introcosmos. So we have the microcosmos, the macrocosmos, but we also have something called the introcosmos. And we almost, because it's such a, uh, it's an experience that we take for granted, we have to sometimes struggle for descriptions to talk about it. And even though researchers do refer to it, they really haven't hammered out all the different aspects of this intro cosmos. So that's what, that's the first feature. That's what mental space, or sometimes James would call it mind space. Um, I like some of the other descriptions you have of it that uh, it's the metaphors of place linguistically cavitate the body that you, you right. say in my heart, in my head, in my gut. Okay. Right. What is those? What are those things? Those, those are mental ways of doing that. Uh, and those are actually very old ways of doing that, uh, of saying that, you know, in my gut, I feel dis you know, discomfort uh, or in my heart, I don't feel right. right. Uh, so the, I think those are very good examples of saying that you're basically using your body as a stage mm -hmm. where That's you're right. imagining different things happening. There aren't those things happening there. <laughs> Right. But you are actually doing, you are actually imagining that as a tool for simulating what is actually going on or what could possibly uh, go on. Right. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so let's go to the next one, uh, second one. And that is, you call it introception. Right. So these are, this is another word that uh, I don't usually like to make up words. Um, but I, I just feel forced to make up a few neologisms, and this is one of them. So we know what perception is, information coming through the senses. We know what conception is, a con to have concepts, thinking. But perception and conception, we're not conscious. We're not experiencing those things. However, introception is the mental material that we do experience. And introception, uh, another way to describe it, it uh, sometimes people use the term quasi-perception. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a perception of the physical world when we use our mental space, but it is still an experience. It is still what philosophers call the experience of qualia, you know, which is another uh, term that's difficult to get our minds around. but. Um, uh, in any case, usually when we think of introception, we think of visual experiences or mental imagery, or sometimes auditory. We can all hear in our heads the voices of our parents or our loved ones or our dog barking if you try. Um, usually introception, we do not have other quasi-perceptual experiences such as uh, touch or haptic or smell, that, that's a bit unusual. However, um, I, I just have to add this uh, personal note. I um, did have two or three times uh, olfactory hallucination or a, a hallucination of smelling something, very distinct, very powerful. And it was the, um, the type of uh, so guano, uh, uh, what is it? It's a type of cacti, cactus in Arizona. So in any case, you know, I, I make that point to show how anytime we have introceptual experiences, it's a type of hallucination, a quasi hallucination. Excellent. So folks, what we're trying to do here, again, I want to step back. We're trying to talk about conscious interiority. Okay, so you can put that in the center and you can draw a big circle. And these 12 things are different aspects of it. So these are like 12 different ways you can actually get at it, or you can look at the 12 different aspects of it. So hear them all out, try to follow as much as you can. You don't, you may not get each and every one of them, but even if you get few of them, you'll be able to triangulate. 
and know what this conscious interiority is a little bit better than just the words and the description of conscious interiority that we have put on the table. All right, so the third one is self-observing and self-observed. Right, so self-observing and self-observed can really be broken down into two uh, features. And self-observing just means uh, analog I, this belief that there is this I floating around in my head. And the I has a very specific function. It is the active subject of our selfhood. We have this notion that the I makes decisions for us, we might say, sort of like a little person in our head. Um, then the, the, uh, the other feature, self-observed. So when I self say self-observed, the idea here is that we have this feeling that we can see that our I can observe our me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, that's um, kind of a, a, it sounds a little bit strange at first, but just think of the, the me as the more passive object of selfhood. And elsewhere, actually, I've written about this. Uh, uh, how there are probably about 10 or 12 different ways to talk about how I and me relate to each other. And it gets a little bit, I don't want to go into too many, too much detail here because it, it gets a, a bit, um, it's a bit, it gets a bit complicated because we're not used to thinking of ourself as usually as divided between uh, subject self and an object self. But I, I, I notice in counseling, sometimes it's a very useful way to facilitate uh, healing. It's a very useful way to have people think of themselves as a I and a me. So in any case, if anyone has any questions about that, um, of course they can ask. And I'll, one other point about I and me, you can't have one without the other. They're sort of like in, in orbit around each other, if you can visualize that. Uh, I and me are important because they allow us to envision different versions of ourselves. So our, our I can look at the me and come up with different me's, different roles uh, that we can play if we want to perhaps improve ourselves uh, within the context of not just, not just counseling, but in, in daily life, actually. No, I think I think that's a very powerful, powerful idea of this distinction, because me is kind of given, whereas I is the more active part or kind of will. You can put it like the, the, the carrier of the will as opposed to more passive part of just what is given and being able to distinguish them allows you to actually get distance from yourself so you can work on yourself. Otherwise, you're kind of all like this one mush and you don't know what, what you can do. So this actually gives you the separation uh, of kind of I looking at me is mm -hmm. like you are saying that, yes, I am this right now, but I could be that. Yes. So it allows you to be the actor transforming yourself from one state to, to another. It allows for change of self. Self-change, yeah. Yes. Wonderful. All right. The fourth one is self-narratization. This is important. So go, let's spend some time on it. Go ahead. So in order to have self-narratization, we have to have a place where we narratize, narratize ourselves, which of course is in mental space. And when we, when we narratize, the idea is we're just making a personal timeline my past me present me future me and again to understand james we have to go back to archaic times when people didn't really self narratize i mean they, 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 they had a vague notion of it but not like conscious people do um so this allows us to look in the past at past selves and see what mistakes we committed, how we can change ourselves. A personal timeline also allows us to look toward the future, to come up with a menu of choices, different routes that we might take. So in terms of mental adaptability, it's a very powerful concept. 
And so much of storytelling actually is a type of narrative, has a narrative structure. So it, it's a very inherent part of, uh, I think, the way uh, the mind works. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'll stop there if you want sure. to. Uh, sure. Um, so I, I want to connect it up. I mean, I think this is a huge point. So let's spend a couple of minutes minutes on it at least. Um, before the subjective consciousness, there were stories. Uh, there were stories, but they, stories were given to you. You know, the, you, are, you have all these myths and you use those sto stories to guide your life. And you have the words, so the mechanics of the story of the actual language that produces the story. Now, with the breakdown of the bicameral mind or breakdown of the society, where the myths, using of the myths as is, no longer works for you. Mm -hmm. You are now left, you're kind of lost, right? I mean, this is the state that James describes of that you are lost, you know, your God has forsaken you. The goddess that walks with you is, doesn't walk with you anymore and you are lost you still have the language. You still remember the stories that don't work anymore. So what you have, what you end up doing is that you use your analog eye to start making your own stories yes. or projecting your own paths. Before this, you were simply following the path that was given to you by the stories that you heard. So you are, you are kind of obeying that obeying the general patterns yes. of society. What this does is that it puts you in the driver's seat for the first time where you are making up your own story. You are creating possible scenarios, possible things you could do. You are weighing the pros and cons of different paths in the story and choosing a story after all that de deliberation. So it's basically using the technology that of language that was used in the stories of the past and using it to a completely new purpose. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it does. I, and so actually what you're talking about uh, in, in, in how you described it are a few other features of conscious interiority that we'll talk about later, uh, self-autonomy, self-authorization. Uh, so, so the idea is that now the person is in charge of their own lives, which again, it's something we take for granted, but in ancient times, I think it was uh, very different. Wonderful. I just want to make a note that tomorrow at 12 o'clock, we are going to be doing a meetup which covers ideas of Magda Arnold. And for her, the idea of self-ideal was a crucial concept and which is very closely related to this. And what she held is that it's your self-ideal, your projection and your um, working with your self-ideal is how you direct your entire uh, kind of psychology. So that it's a very, very profound point. So don't miss that meet meetup uh, tomorrow at 12 o'clock. All right. Um, so let's go to the next one. Um, let me see here. Okay. Exerption. So exerption is a type of editing of what is parading past our mind. Uh, William James, the, the great American psychologist, talked about stream of consciousness. And so I think one way to come to terms with what excerption means is just picture debris or different things floating on this stream. And the eye picks, or chooses, pulls out of the water certain things to make up some sort of story, to solve a problem, whatever it is. That's what excerption is. And again, it's one of these things that we take for granted. We don't usually stop and monitor all these things uh, flowing in front of our mind's uh, eye. But 
basically that's what the excerption is. Um, and I, I, I think a good metaphor is mental editing. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a huge point because um, we notice so many things, you know, there is just so many things that, that you notice and it's a way of selective focus, yeah. you know, selectively choosing something uh, and leaving out the rest, which actually enables the further processing of it because otherwise you would be just drowning with just a lot of data. So that's, that's a great point. Next, next up is concilium. So consilience again, it's, it's a little bit abstract as a concept. Uh, Jane's claim that this uh, goes back to an older psychological term, a simulation. So how do we fit different concepts together? How do we make them stick? And this uh, consilience is, is a little bit difficult because it's it's not easy to see how it helps the mind adapt. Um, it, it you often consilience can cause problems. Uh, James talked about how a good example of when consilience, consilience occurs is in dreaming, and our mind is confronted with very disparate, very. Uh, different types of information and it tries to form a narrative the mind is always trying to tell itself a story but because the pieces of, of mental content that are linked together in the dream don't belong together dreams have a very otherworldly surrealistic feel to them so that's an, that, that, that that's what happens when consilience goes too far in daily life an example of consilience might be association mm -hmm. uh, associating um a with B. So if I put my hand on a hot stove, I'm going to associate the stove in my hand with pain. And I'll learn not to do that again. So we can see that there are many uh, adaptive functions of consilience. But uh, it, 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 it's something that, um, you know, happens all the time that we, we, we take it for granted. And then what happens is, if we put two things together that should not be together, then we have, then we might develop, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder. So for example, because I burned my hand on a stove once, anytime I see a stove, I will not go into a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then I'm afraid of going into a house with a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then of course that interferes with my daily life. So we can see how these features of consciousness have an adaptive aspect, but they can also have a, uh, uh, a maladaptive aspect. Wonderful. So folks, what we're doing is that each of these we are describing, we're about halfway done. We have described about six different features. Through all of this, we are trying to talk about what conscious interiority is. These are all features of conscious interiority. Okay. Next up is concentration. So concentration is the interiorized version of perceptual attention. Because remember, all these features that we're talking about are mental versions of what we do in the real physical world. They're sort of simulated versions, you might say. And so usually we give perceptual attention to something, but we do not necessarily have to be conscious of it. <laughs> However, concentration is a uh, conscious version, interiorized version of attention. And, it, and the idea, it allows us very simply to focus. I mean, we've, we've all struggled sometimes trying to focus on something. And consciousness gives us the ability to super focus in a way that probably bicameral people uh, could not do. Yeah, I know this is, uh, concentration is huge. I mean, the entire... Um, Indian philosophy, for Indian philosophy, this is the, this is a core idea in Indian philosophy of consciousness, what, what, what you need to do with, with your consciousness. So that's a huge idea. Uh, next up is suppression. So suppression is the mental version or the interiorized version of what we do when we physically 
avoid something or we turn away from something, uh, we, in our minds, we suppress things. It's not Freudian repression. That's a bit uh, different. They're related, but that's but suppression uh, is different. And again, suppression can help us by deleting certain excerptions or the deleting certain thoughts so we don't get uh, distracted. But suppression can also be bad. It can lead to repression. <laughs> it, uh, and we're not even conscious of why we're suppressing something. <clears throat> Excuse me. And of course, that's the basis of a lot of uh, psychotherapy. So all, all of these like exception, suppression, concentration, it's kind of selectivity of, of focus in, in various ways. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Uh, next up is self-authorization. So the next four features all have self in them. Mm -hmm. Self-authorization, <coughs> excuse me. The idea here is what is it that authorizes my behavior or the behavior of, of another person? Who or what is giving me permission? Who is allowing me? Who is encouraging or discouraging me from acting in a certain way? And of course, in bicameral times, it was the gods or the ancestors. But with conscious people, it's the self. And of course, the self is a, uh, one of these vague terms like consciousness. But in any case, with, with self-authorization means that I am legit, I, I myself in a reflex, ref, reflexive manner am legitim, legitimizing my own behavior. And again, we take that for granted, but think of uh, in a, psycho, a psychotherapeutic uh, counseling session where somebody is not taking responsibility for their actions, right? They, some people end up, things go wrong and they blame other people for everything when in fact, perhaps they need to change. So it's a useful way to identify what or who is authorizing a person's behavior. Wonderful. Um, next up is self-autonomy. So self-autonomy, I think we're very uh, familiar with it. Um, it it's related to self-authorization, but actually not the same thing. So this is a sense that I have control over my uh, decisions uh, and it's related to uh, self-confidence or perhaps a lack of self-confidence, uh, self-direction. Uh, what do I want to do with myself? Um, so we, we hear that term a lot these days, actually, the, the, the importance of agency and autonomy. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, last two of uh, self-individuation. So another word for this might be self-individualization, but in any case, this is about what is unique about me as an individual. And I think in liberal, democratic, industrialized societies, we take it for granted that expressing our thoughts, that articulating what we're thinking and feeling, what's special about each individual is some sort of universal norm. When in fact, it's a very modern way of, um, of thinking of personhood. And so self-individuation -in concerns uh, as I said, what is special about me? And from a practical point of view, this is important because some people need to be reminded what's special about them. We often forget what our strengths are. Uh, and sometimes we end up being negative and just looking at our weaknesses. And so in a counseling context, the idea here is to draw out from a person what is worthy of you, what is special about you. Okay. Last one is self-reflexivity. <clears throat> so self-reflexivity, I usually put last because this is uh, the most difficult one. And it actually implicates a lot of philosophical notions. Uh, basically, it's, it's, it's a little more than just meaning self-reflection. It's not just about thinking about a problem or thinking about myself. Self-reflexivity self concerns this ineffable, indescribable feeling of meanness or I-ness or selfness that no other person in the universe has. And self-reflexivity emerges 
from the interplay between the I and the me. Again, as I said before, you, you need both. And sometimes the I and the me, it's almost as if uh, they start having a dialogue, a conversation. And this leads to this uh, very difficult to pin down uh, almost a sensation of who or, or what I am. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the more self-reflective we are, of course, the more self-objective we can be. It leads to self-corrective abilities. And just to be a little bit mystical, if you allow me, it's just my uh, a personal belief I have that if there is a purpose uh, to existence, to the cosmos, it's being self-reflexive. And uh, whether you believe in God or not, I think one way to understand self-reflexivity self is to view it as God looking through an eyeball at himself or herself, mm -hmm. and you are that eyeball. And of course, I'm not the first person to use that description, but to me, there seems to be a real, almost spiritual sense to what self-reflexivity is. Wow. Wow. Okay. I mean, we'll have opportunities of going into details of this later on, but what I want to do <clears throat> is um, I want to look at all these 12 from the flip side. So let's look at the culture, the, the bicameral mind. And let's look at now from the absence of these, Let, let's look at mm -hmm. if we can see absence of this in a bicameral mind. Um, now, in some ways, um, you know, uh, so, so that gives us like the, the opposite, you know, the, the foil to see that. Right. So what in bicameral mind, uh, there is no mental space in the sense that they are just, it's kind of stimulus response that is going on. I'm, I'm just going to run through them. Uh, sure. You can go ahead and do the same, uh, making your own observations. Sure. So there is no, um, no mental space. You're not able to kind of separate yourself and think of yourself. Uh, it, it's just kind of stimulus response. Things, you kind of ha hear voices, you think that this should be done and you just do it. Uh, there is, uh, I'm going to skip interoception. There is not focus on kind of self-observing. So there is no analog I that we are talking about or uh, me. There is no self narratization You are drowned in stories that are given to you, myths that are given to you. Uh, you're kind of flowing with everything that you have uh, in terms of kind of editing. You're not doing that much of it. The consilience is happening probably automatically but not, not explicitly. Um, the, so the editing feature is not that much, you know, so because editing requires almost you saying that this is what is important. This is what I need to focus on. Therefore, I need to not focus on other things uh, and kind of self-authorization, self-autonomy, self-individualization, uh, individuation and self risk all of them contain the self, which kind of, assumes this analog I, that there is this right. person in you who is saying that I authorize myself. I am going to do, it's my autonomy, or it's kind of focusing on my individual strength. So it's all of that depends or self-reflexivity, a distinction between I and me, all of them are presupposing this analog I, which is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, is that a fair way of describing or what the bicameral mind would be? Actually, um, I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I can tell you really been thinking about this um, because that's a very good description. And, uh, you know, in the past, when I've talked to people about this, you know, it just, just sounds crazy that people would lack some of these features of, of conscious interiority. So yes, that, that's actually a very good uh, description. Absolutely. I mean, the way, again, you know, the mm. easiest way I can um, kind of imagine this is in children mm. or in kind of more traditional cultures where people are just kind of saying, okay, this is how we do things. This is how things are done. And they're just doing those things. There isn't an I who is trying to say, okay, should I, is this the right thing to do? Should I be doing this? You know, it's like, this is how th things are done. Uh, in, in Indian uh, language, there is a term hamare me. That means in my group of people, in my culture, this is how things are done. And that is the ruling thing. 
also in children, right, who don't have a separate mental space, very young children, they are also operating pretty much like this. So that's that's the base that I, I use in order to kind of figure out how, how I think it would be like. Uh, and in some ways, you know, when you are not, if when you are being reactive, you are also like that. Right. In the sense that you forget that you, because it is a conscious effort to use your conscious interiority. It mm -hmm. is very easy to be reactive. You know, something, somebody says something and you just react. And there you're not using your mental space. You're not using your analog eye. You're not considering different alternatives. You're just reacting. And in that sense, you're, you're in that case, you're missing these features. Uh, or on, in other, other words, you're not having this conscious interiority. In other words, you're not being self-aware. You're just being reactive. And you're not that different from uh, somebody operating in bicameral mind or even more primitive stage. Right. <gasps> yep. Okay. Yeah. I, think, I think this is very good. I think we have put enough things on table. Um, how about wrapping up? Um, just so we've been talking about conscious interiority. Is there anything else you want to say about conscious interiority before we go to breakout rooms? Um, well, just to emphasize, we've used this uh, metaphor before to view conscious interiority as a package of mental capabilities that allow us to simulate the real physical world. They allow us to take, sh it allows us to take a, a shortcut it allows us to imagine things that might be risky to perform in the real world. Um, and so it's actually, uh, uh, th that's why I say it's, it's a very, uh, conscious interiority is a very powerful form of uh, adaptation. Okay, I, I just want to end up with one, one observation. There is a way of cheating, okay, which I strongly recommend. You can dramatically boost your conscious interiority with this. With pen and paper, because what it does is that it expands your mental space. It externalizes it. You're able to play out exactly the same things that we're talking about. You're able to play it out on a piece of paper. You're able to use your powerful visual cortex to, in order to take that in. So the complexity of what you can do in your mental space is dramatically enhanced by pen and paper. So I'm not joking when I say Everybody using pen and paper is going to seriously upgrade our technology, Zoom technology. Okay, Zoom is nothing as compared to this. All right, uh, this is, uh, so anyway, so with that, uh, folks, we're going to start the breakout rooms. Uh, we have the rules in the breakout rooms. Please, please give everybody two minutes to talk about the best of their observations to start the discussion. Uh, that's rule number one. Uh, that's that's the starting point. Keep on topic. We're talking about conscious interiority today. Be brief, be courteous, encourage others to speak. And if needed, uh, for any reason, if the breakout room is not working for you, just click on ask for help and I'll help you. Um, we're going to do this for 20 minutes. Keep track on paper of all your great observations. Brian and I would love to hear what your takeaways are and any questions that you have. Starting the breakout rooms now for takeaways. Really wanna know what you thought about this. This is a very difficult topic to talk about. Uh, we've got four rules as always. Rule number one, type exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to speak. Rule number two, keep on topic. We're talking about conscious interiority. Rule number three, be brief. And rule number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. We're going to start with Jyoti. So you can go ahead and uh, type in your exclamation mark if you would like to speak. Uh, Jyoti, go ahead. Yeah. A very interesting 12 features or components that make the consciousness. Um, in my, uh, in our uh, breakout rooms, a um, couple of us were discussing about the cultural values that interfere. Uh, like um, Shikant had said, Hamari, 
that means we in our culture, um, we, be, we become very cultural as opposed to I and me. And that to, for me, it was a cognitive and metacognitive process to separate myself from the culture. Because when it came to introspection, I was me, I was I. But when it came to making decisions, I was we. So it was very difficult in the beginning for me to understand I can still be an individual. I can be all right by just being by myself, by me. However, slowly, slowly, I realized in my culture, uh, if I had that attitude, which was to me, it was not an attitude. It is a process of coming out of your culture to become uh, non, not necessarily non-culture, you re retain some aspects of your culture, but then you are also saying within that culture, I can be, my, be me and I. So having said that, I was never a candidate for psychotherapy because of that, but I can see how that would stand in a person's growth and in um, self-reflection uh, if you were carrying both the perspectives in your mind at the same time. So do you, would you like to sh uh, comment on that, Brian? Sure, yes. Uh, I think what you said um, indicates that you, you really grasped those concepts, which I think at first um, for some people can be a little bit, um, uh, a, a little bit confusing, um, but uh, I, the way I would describe what you were talking about is the problem of seeing the world through the eyes of others. And that's what happens many times when we uh, come from a culture or perhaps a family, you know, family dynamics, perhaps, where the group is overriding and we're not allowed to grow as a person. And of course, there's nothing wrong with belonging to a group. There's nothing wrong with cultural traditions. There's nothing wrong with community. That's what makes us human. But like anything else, um, for lack of a better term, groupism can hinder the individual, the self-development. And this relates all these self-words, self-autonomy, self-authorization, uh, uh, self-individuation, self-reflexivity. We can see they're all sort of the, the same concept, uh, very much related in, in a way. And the, the way I like to look at it is that every person is a culture. And so, uh, you know, th that's my ideal that when I meet someone for the first time, I try not to assume, make any assumptions by the way they look or talk. I try to assume that there's a universe inside that person. So, 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 so many rich experiences, so many different meanings that are not obvious that take a long time to draw out. Um, so in any case, yes, it, it's a, I, I would agree. Okay, can you hear me right yes. now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, good, good, sorry. So uh, there are two features that caught my attention more and I will talk about them. Uh, the first one is suppression, suppression. And it caught my attention because I consider myself someone who doesn't have a good memory. I tend to forget certain uh, facts from my life, things from uh, uh, the past, for example, things that I forget that I, experiences that I don't remember anymore. So uh, I'd like to know one question is that I'd like to know uh, with the positive aspects and the negative aspects of suppression. Very good. For example, someone, sure. oh, all right, someone who has a trauma in life and, and then he forgets, she forgets, is that a way to uh, self-defense? This is, this, is, this is a question. Thank you. And then you. I would complete with another uh, picture. I can say that uh, afterwards if you want. No, no, go ahead and say it right away. Go ahead. All right. Okay. So another feature is self autonomy. And I remember children, uh, and I'd like to know if, if there is some uh, something published, some, something good to read about it on the internet or any source uh, talking about how adults should stimulate uh, uh, children's self autonomy according to their stage in life. Thank you, Brian. So, 
Um, I'll answer the, the first, the, the second question first about self-autonomy. Um, I, I can't think of anything in particular on the internet um, to address your question, which is a, a very good question. Um, but I'm sure if you search around, you'll find something. Often self-autonomy is related to the problem of um, lack of self-esteem. And there's actually a tremendous amount written on uh, self-esteem as a problem, uh, not just with children, but of course with adults. To get back to your first question about the suppression. So all these features have a, <clears throat> an adaptive functional aspect and they have a maladaptive, malfunctioning aspect. And so suppression basically uh, in, 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 from the positive perspective, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, suppression just allows us to have a filter in our mind. It allows us not to pay attention to things at that moment that are interfering with something that we have given a priority to. Uh, to put it simply, the bad thing about suppression is that it sometimes blurs over to repression. And what I mean is sometimes there's a, something happened to us that was painful, some trauma, or we don't like somebody for some reason, whatever, and we just suppress any associated thoughts with that person or with that incident, with that event. And usually we know we're doing that consciously, <clears throat> but sometimes it can happen unconsciously. And then it becomes a type of repression and we're not even aware that we're doing it. We're not even aware of what the, why we made those negative associations in the first place. Thank you. Next up is Dominique, Zulea, Jean, Kevin, and Rojin. Dominique. Thank you, Shukran. And please feel free to suggest if, um, to pass along my question if it's too far from, from the topic at hand. Okay. So I, I sort of wanted to uh, reconnect again to uh, with a topic we ha I had with Dr. Brian in the break room, uh, which we talked about, so people know, um, the sort of birth of the, this mental space. And Dr. Brian kindly explained that it was more, is not was not a biological change, but more of like a, an, uh, an evolution of ideas and cultures, let's say cultural ever, iterations. So then the sort of next question was then, since um, he explained that maybe one of the purpose for humans is um, for self-reflection, I, I asked him like, what would be then humans and maybe the nature of humanity itself once we have reached that point of, of where we could, mat, uh, of, ma of maximum of where cultural iteration could happen. Where then he, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that he might have coined a new term. Uh, he says uh, maybe a psychological singularity will happen. Um, so then my question is for him is, okay, so, and sorry, Dr. Ryan, to put you on the spot on this. Um, which current culture you think might be at the forefront on this uh, psychological singularity? And secondly, in modern times, uh, what would be the number one impediment that you feel is uh, that might be this cultural iteration to happen? Okay, so <clears throat> that's a very <clears throat> that's a very tough question <clears throat> because it's very philosophical. Um, which culture? I I I, I would never uh, hazard. I would, I would never dare to say. Um, uh, because each culture has something to offer. So that, that's, that's difficult to say. In terms of impediment, well, I, I can only speak in very vague terms what would prevent psychological, psychological singularity. And I want to be clear, I don't know what psychological singularity is. I haven't really thought it out. So again, we're talking in the realm of very abstract, philosophical, almost religious ideas. But if I did have to say something, I would say that Self-deception is the major impediment to any type of psychological insight or psychological singularity. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Zulea, Jean, and Kevin. Zulea. Hi, all. I raised a naive question, and maybe I can raise it um, to Brian to uh, hear too. There are I... no naive questions. <laughs> naive. There are no, no naive questions, no stupid questions. Go ahead. I just 
I just heard about James. I don't know uh, his work. Um, just uh, listening to you, this seems to be a very interesting framework theory of mind. And just a couple of questions coming up to my mind would be, is there a space, is it incorporated in any way, the workings of the spirit? Or since we are also talking about this in terms of psychology, therapy, is there also a space for subconscious of us or unconscious in all of these features that you are listening? Is it directly, indirectly, uh, in an aware where these concepts are also incorporated somewhere, somewhere in this framework? Spirit, the workings of heart or unconscious? So for your first question, again, that's a big question. Um, I, James did not specifically study religion for the sake of religion. Um, he was interested in <clears throat> the psychology of religion. So he did not <clears throat> specifically address notions of uh, a spirituality. But personally, I would say that, uh, of course, spirituality should play, can play a role in any individual's life. Um, but it becomes a challenge to figure out for that individual what that spirituality is. Uh, for your the second question about uh, heart, I'm, I'm not sure exactly um, what you might mean by heart, but with unconscious, or I prefer non-conscious, that most certainly plays a role, uh, I think, in trying to understand what James was saying. And the reason why is because most of the time we are not conscious throughout most of the day. We have the illusion that we're conscious. And what needs to be explained is not non-conscious psychological processes. We have a lot of information about that. We know a lot about how the non-conscious how the, how the mind works from a non-conscious perspective, actually. The mystery is consciousness. That's what James was trying to say. But because we're so used to consciousness, because we think we're conscious all the time, we don't really interrogate it the way it, it should be interrogated. So that probably doesn't answer uh, fully your uh, questions, but I think they're very important uh, topics. Excellent. I just want to say that this is uh, Brian's book on psychology of uh, the Bible. So he, he, has, he has himself, though, though James did not write extensively about it, uh, Brian has. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one thing now. Uh, it's going to be Gene, Kevin, Rojin, Jeff, Rob, and Judith. Gene. Hi, Brian. Thanks for the lecture. So I discussed in our group, I think I share a very similar background as Jody, grew up from China. It's very group, you know, thinking, dominant. So I'm kind of second kids. I think there's a second kids or middle kids mentality. This is more rebelling. So I'm more individualized, you know, self, more self-consciousness, which bring a lot of trouble actually when I grew up. That's why I moved to the US and feel more at home. And the funny thing is I in another advanced group, uh, Korean group, and the American artist actually he shares, he thinks too much individual self-consciousness actually, maybe not self-conscious, it's more individualized in American investing culture actually make people more isolated. So mm -hmm. they don't really feel this belonging. And he actually envy the Eastern culture, the Chinese culture, the people a communal, and I was like, it's not as good as you think. <laughs> so it may look good. So, and I know Koyan mentioned a group consciousness. I wonder, do we, does need to everybody go through this self-consciousness uh, process, then we reach this group consciousness. It seems to be a long, long way to go because it seems not, it's the long way to everybody to reach that self-consciousness first. So I wonder what's your thought on that? Well, I'm not sure what group consciousness would be exactly. Um, but to get back to what you, and that's the problem in English, and I think other languages too, where uh, when we talk about group consciousness, that type of consciousness is very different from a psychological individual consciousness. So they really need to be disentangled. But to get back to this issue of too much individualism, uh, too much groupism, uh, I, I think that in especially modern times, all societies face that challenge. And we really, no matter where you're from, China, 
or uh, uh, United States or uh, Germany, wh wherever. Um, the problem is how can we balance individuality with groupism? Because you cannot be a human being unless you're part of a social group, unless you come from some sort of hopefully a background where you had a, a solid family relations. But at the same time, humans need to express themselves. They need to articulate themselves. They need to, as I say, self-individuate. And so the challenge becomes, as I said, how do you balance these two things? And all societies face that, uh, face that struggle. Next up is Kevin, Rogin, and Jeff. Kevin. Thank you. Uh, good presentation again, Brian. Uh, I'm very interested in how the conscious interiority is working our personal life cycle. Uh, the question is like, when is the conscious interior appearing in our own personal life? Um, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So um, what I, the, 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 I would begin by addressing your question by saying that when uh, a, a person is born, they don't have conscious and they probably do not become fully conscious until, I don't know, maybe seven or eight uh, because consciousness is something that they have to learn. And I would like to think that each individual as we go through life uh, learns how to cultivate the different features of consciousness because that is really, I think, how you can become a, a better person because you're just trying to um, learn about yourself and learn about your world, uh, to, uh, to put it simply. And I think that our definitions of our self, our self-individuation is very much, of course, being a feature of consciousness. I think these things do change as we uh, get older. Uh, I, I think especially if you look at self-narrativization, and I think our, we, I think in order to transition as we get older, what we, we, what we have to pay attention how to reframe our memories, our good memories, but especially our bad memories. Uh, because the older you get, of course, if you've lived a very rich life, you're probably also going to have a lot of negative experiences. Um, and you don't want those experiences to weigh you down as you get older. Thank you. Next up is going to be Rogine, Jeff, Rob, Judith, Mike, and Francoise. Rogine. Uh, I have a question. I have an intensive um, experience called the Hoffman process, where explicitly many, many hours of being alone with yourself, no reason to snap into your usual persona. They had us create a location in our mind, um, a space, and uh, had another version of ourself come to that space and interact. So there was an I and a me. Um, is that creating more mental space or just, well, I, that's as close as I can come <laughs> to a question. Um, can we learn, that's it, learn to create a new mental space that's a new thing. Is that learnable? Uh, absolutely. I think that uh, using mental imagery is something, because it is learned and acquired when you're young, it's something that can be expanded upon and improved. In fact, uh, going back to the classical uh, Greco-Roman period, uh, people who would speak in front of audience audiences and argue would uh, try to improve the the amount of space in their head there, there are actually things written on this 
uh, that go back a couple thousand years. So uh, most definitely it, it can be uh, expanded. And remember these features that we talked about today, these features of conscious interiority, there's nothing new about them. Uh, you know, other, uh, we use these all the time. Uh, my agenda is to just more clearly delineate them to show us that we have all these things in us. We use these things all the time, but if we can theorize about them and cultivate them, it can help improve uh, whatever problem we're facing. Um, and I think that's especially true with clinicians. Clinicians use a lot of these features, especially things like self narratization mental imagery in their sessions. But what I'm trying to do is show how they're all connected and theorize them. Thank you. Next up is going to be Jeff, Rob, and Judith. Jeff. I just want to thank, thank you, uh, Brian and Srikant, for this. I, I really think it's, it's brilliant. Um, I want to focus on one, one part of it. Uh, I literally have eight pages of notes here, Brian, from, your, um, from what you're saying. Um, I want to focus on self-narratization for just a second kind of the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves in the world, as you said. And, and I, I think of them in three ways. One, just about the past. You know, however, I think of the stages of my life and whatever seemed to have been the most impactful experiences and what I learned from them. And second, you know, what questions I used to decide on those stages and the most impactful experiences and the lessons I think I learned. And then the same thing for now in this time and for the future. And I have found that kind of reflection, both from other people, as well as um, in my own kind of consideration about my own life and what I've learned, trying to, you know, as they'd say, learn the best things. I have found that very useful. And I wonder how, how you would consider that, how you'd consider those kinds of things. Okay. Well, um... Yes, I, so something you said about what questions you use to look at right. your past. And so I, 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 I think what you're saying is that those questions determine how you look at your past. Those questions determine what you are excerpting out or what you are editing, what you're emphasizing, what you're not emphasizing. And so the idea uh, is to pay attention to the questions uh, that we ask about our past, also about our present and future for that matter. Um, and, you know, the, the, the word here is reframing. How do we reframe our past? So there's not much I can add to what you said, uh, except to say that you described very well uh, what uh, clinicians will often try to do in, in sessions and also what we do, what the average person does uh, throughout their lives. But what's important is finding the time to do it, taking the opportunity to do it, because what happens is we only become self-reflexive. We only self-narratize when something bad happens to us. And so my suggestion is maybe at least for five, 10 minutes a day, we should check in with ourselves and see where we're going and where we were. That's excellent. Uh, thank you, Jeff and Brian. Next up is uh, Rob, Judith, Mike, and Francoise. Rob. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, interesting uh, discussion. Um, so a few things, uh, one about child development. Um, I remember, well, I was told that I had an imaginary friend when I was younger. That's interesting. Um, the other interesting thing is uh, when my daughter went to kindergarten, um, they had every month uh, the task of drawing a, in their, they had a journal and they drew in the book uh, a picture of themselves. And it, I thought it was interesting that uh, my daughter's first pictures of herself were very much like uh, what Julian James pictured as uh, you know, the Bronze Age picture of the Greek uh, soldiers with uh, you know, odd appendages and such. That's how she pictured herself, just like they did back in those times. And then as the year went on, her pictures became more and more you know, what we'd normally think of as a, as a human. So, Child development, it seems that uh, the kindergarten experience had, had some role in her evolving or developing a, a conscious perspective or introspective perspective that we would um, 
have now. And I wonder if um, that's a deliberate role of kindergarten or if that's, or how that comes about. You could take a look at this, this period in the child's development and look and learn something about how consciousness develops. Mm -hmm. And the other thing uh, is that I've noticed that uh, what you guys, are, what Brian is talking about seems somewhat parallel to a, a therapy method called dialectic behavior therapy. I want any anything in there, any meat in that um, observation. And the final thing I want to ask about is um, it's kind of an observation that Bronze Age humanity did not have mental illness. So um, I would wonder, uh, my, my question is, does consciousness play a, well, determinative role in, in mental illness. I mean, you talk about mental, uh, about uh, consciousness as having um, aspects of what, uh, separateness, able to separate yourself from something, suppress things, deny things, uh, stop or slow the processing of things so you can introspect on something. Um, you can, yeah, the, the ability to deceive and self deceive, um, the ability to control things which probably shouldn't be controlled. I wonder. Um, so it, my, my impression there is that uh, these aspects of consciousness play a determinative role in, in mental illness. And I wonder if uh, some effective therapy might not be to um, somehow stop the conscious mind from stopping what needs to happen, which would be a different way of dealing with trauma or, or mental pain, or emotional anguish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. So actually, that's, that's a lot of uh, uh, interesting material you brought up. So uh, yes, I, I, I think education, of course, I, I think schools are going to be different on what they, what they do in the classroom. But I, I, I never heard that before about uh, having children draw themselves. Um, but uh, it, it, it's certainly an interesting way to study the emergence of uh, self-consciousness. Uh, getting back to DBT, dialectic behavior therapy, uh, um, I won't go into details now, except to say that in my book, I spend a lot of time talking about DBT because it does resonate with what James had to say. And all therapies, I think, um, resonate with what James had to say, actually. And then your third question about mental illness in ancient times. Of course, it's very difficult to know uh, because of the linguistic uh, challenge. Did ancient people have mental illness? Apparently, they did have mental illness, but the question becomes what type of mental illness? And related to that, uh, I think it's very important how you pointed out how consciousness can actually spiral out of control and either cause a mental illness or it can certainly make a mental illness worse. And that's why in my book, in my chapter, I, excuse me, in my book, I have a whole chapter on what I call runaway consciousness or how consciousness, the features of consciousness can snowball out of control and actually be harmful. And so that's the interesting thing about uh, consciousness. It's this wonderful thing that opens up the world for humankind in so many ways but like all bodies of knowledge, like all complicated machines, something is going to go wrong. And so uh, that, that's a very important uh, point. I'm, I'm glad you uh, brought that up. Excellent. We always like to do syntopical connections uh, in our meetups. So let me do one here with uh, Boyd. We looked at uh, Boyd's theory, uh, epistemological theory of creation and destruction, where he talks about the way you, you live well in this world is to keep abstracting, coming up with a model of what's going on and acting on it, and then redo the model all the time. And he, what he was pointing out is that moment you kind of fixed your model, you begin to die because you that model, your kind of self, you know, focusing on that model out. So it becomes like a closed system. The, the model needs to be an open system. It has to take in feedback from outside. So the danger, biggest danger to conscious processing is to become just inward focused without having connections uh, to, to outside. Uh, that's how I, I, I would put it. Uh, next up is going to be Judith, Mike, Francoise, and Madeline. Judith. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So um, it struck me several times you said, uh, most of the time we are not conscious. And um, 
Also, the descriptions, the 12 factors, they seem very language dominant, and I don't know if there are any that are not, but um, they're very dominant in what the thoughts, the words that we have in our head. So my question is, um, when we're immersed, or when an artist, say, is immersed in producing art, or if we're like taking a walk in nature and just like really immersed in that environment and not thinking about our lives or um, different, um, but still same kind of thing that I'm trying to get at is, um, you know, extreme sports where, where people are not just like skiing, but where they're like um, maybe, maybe skiing down, you know, uh, a really steep cliff where nobody else goes and, and their bodies just take them or they're surfing and they're, their bodies just seem not to know what to do. And if you hear these people describe their experiences, it's like, they're not really thinking each thing out. It's happening so fast and it's a really amazing experience for them, like religious experience. So um, where would this fall? Are they unconscious? Oh, and then children, I wanna throw children in there too. Like when children are just um, maybe playing in their own world, I don't know if this really fits, but at those moments or in those times, are, are people conscious? Would that fall in the category of concentration? Um, it doesn't seem like all of them would. And, um, but it, at the same time, it's not, it, there are activities that only humans would do or feel, right? Um, I don't know that animals or bicameral people necessarily would, I don't know. But if you could address that, that, that would be nice, thank you. Okay, so um, to get back to what you said about the features being language dominant. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's actually true, certainly not for all of them. So for example, when we think of images, uh, language does not necessarily play a role, at least when I think of uh, an image. Um, but in any case, uh, to, to move on to the second thing you said about, um, I think it's many psych psychologists describe it as being in the flow and uh, I would describe that actually as a, a semi-conscious or uh, what I might call a hypnoidal experience coming from, from uh, hypnotism. You're not exactly hypnotized, but you're not exactly fully conscious either. You're in between. And I remember when I used to play judo, uh, the most wonderful experience I would have would be throwing someone uh, using a judo throw, throwing them on the mat and not being aware of it. My mind would take over non-consciously, or I might say it felt like my body took over. And that's why I think it's important to keep in mind that many of our actions, many things that we do have nothing to do with consciousness. It seems that they do, but actually um, so some of the most wonderful things we do actually <laughs> Uh, don't have anything uh, to do with consciousness. So, uh, and then finally, to, to get back to what you said about children, could you just uh, very briefly clarify that uh, question again? I think I'm a little hazy on it. I think it's because I was jumping off of Rob, but like, I mean, I often think, you know, children um, can just be in the zone of their world where they're, they're just playing. So that, I guess that's just unconscious activity. <laughs> right. That's not being conscious, right? Right, right. Uh, yes. And so consciousness comes in degrees, right? So there, there are different features that we talked about today, about a dozen of them. And then each feature probably uh, has, uh, can, can be measured. How you measure them, of course, is a, is a whole nother uh, problem, but we're talking about a matter of degree. So Judy, th those were amazing, uh, ex excellent observations of all kinds. Uh, th so thank you very much. Um, I just want to, again, point out kind of syntopically, uh, I think Daniel Kahneman's uh, concepts here are very powerful, system one and system two. Uh, what happens is that um, even things which are conscious at one point, which you learned by having interior, uh, you know, conscious interiority direct your actions, make it so in a certain way, over time that becomes automatic. And it becomes, you know, for example, the judo part, you know, you would, when you're learning it, you would have to do it deliberately. Right. But once you have, it has become a part of you, that just happens. Uh, and that's system one. Uh, so it was conscious. The thing that was consciously directed at one point 
uh, you're trying to, you know, it ends up being pushed into the unconscious. And that's not bad. That's actually a good thing because mm -hmm. that's what enables us to tremendously increase the repertoire of what we are doing. So for example, when I'm speaking, I'm using all these words and all these sentences and all of those things are just coming to me with an intention. It's not that I'm you know, picking and choosing every word as I go along. Uh, all of it is kind of coming. So it's like, it's, um, uh, you know, so, so there is the, the extent to which the system one works in our lives is very, very large. And comparatively where the conscious interiority comes in is very small, but at the same time, it's like the elephant and the rider. It's that small part actually sets the directions of things over time, the impact is humongous, but the amount of time that you spend on it is, is uh, relatively small. Where would, or, I'm sorry, where would meditation fit in this? May I just follow up? Where would meditation fit in this consciousness? That, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, in my book, I have a whole chapter on hypnosis and meditation. And so uh, meditation, uh, I, I guess, there are two, two way there are two types basically two types of meditation you hear about um concentrative and uh mindfulness so concentrative would be where you just focus on an excerpt in your head or perhaps a, a mantra or uh, something that you're looking at on a wall whatever you, you want to use and so you're using your you're uh using one feature of consciousness while you're maybe trying to play down the other features of consciousness and hopefully that leaves us some sort of insight. Um, uh, so in any case, I, I don't want to get into it too much uh, today, um, but I, 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 that's, a, that's a very uh, important point. I think what Jane said about consciousness actually illuminates what is going on when we're uh, meditating. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably do a whole meetup or at least half a meetup on, on that topic. Uh, because that's one of the large parts of, of uh, Brian's book. Uh, next up is going to be Mike, Francoise, Madeline, and Laura. Mike, I'll give you two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Um, you mentioned, I think you've convinced everybody in the audience uh, that uh, there is evolution in effect. And uh, the question is whether that evolution occurs in a few uh, a few years, like the distance between the uh, uh, Iliad and the Odyssey, or whether it can occur instantaneously um, uh, by just changing the story that uh, we tell ourselves in our, in our head. Um, there are uh, uh, several people who've, uh, who've uh, come up with things like that, in particular, um, uh, uh, Dan Daniel Dennett in the concept of the meme, that once you establish a new meme, uh, the, the story changes and you're able to uh, uh, instantaneously, it's a eureka, I've got it type thing. And uh, I, um, uh, I just wonder if uh, uh, you're, you're visualizing that, uh, how to change that story by either meditation or medication um, would provide a, uh, a quick, uh, uh, a quick um, um, fix in these things. In the same way, uh, Microsoft comes up with a patch to solve a problem uh, with uh, the operating system, and uh, the patient will then say, Eureka, I've got it. Um, and, and one more thing, uh, the mind of the um, of the public is completely different with Twitter and Facebook uh, as uh, as a uh, as a meme uh, than it was before Twitter and Facebook, and uh, so I did. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I, I I'm interested in your reflections, and then I have a short follow up. Okay, um, that that's a lot. So you know we have to be. Um, I'm sure you're aware when we talk about. Uh, evolution. We're not talking about uh, biological evolution. We're talking about social cultural evolution, uh, and uh, and consciousness probably did not arise instantaneously. 
it, it, it took a, a, maybe a, a thousand or 2000 years to gradually develop. And then it's sort of like a tipping point where you had a lot of features of consciousness appeared on the historical scene. And uh, then your question about social media and memes, um, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that, except to agree that, of course, a meme due to social media can spread very quickly. And I think that does, it does show us how fast human mentality, how, how fast human mentality can change. And this relates to how plastic uh, the, ment the, the mind is. And it doesn't take much actually to um, uh, evolve uh, human psychology. Does that uh, answer your question? Uh, yeah, um, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, that uh, you t that uh, once the uh, meme is accepted, um, it, it not which may have taken a hundred years to evolve, um, uh, the next generation learns it uh, in in the first six months of life. Yes. And yes. Uh, Mike, you had a follow up very quick. Very quick. Uh, I got word association of five people who've talked about uh, um, uh, evolution, uh, the evolutionary changes instantaneously. Word association as whether you want to pursue any of those. Uh, one of them, of course, is Dennett. Uh, the second one is Pierre Teilhard de uh, Chardin, who, uh, in addition to coming up with evolution, was condemned by the Catholic Church. The other is Roger Penrose and uh, uh, the Emperor's New Mind. The, and the next one is Graham Hancock. Thank you. And the uh, next one more, Ken Wilber and Spiral Dynamics. And they all have feedback as a major issue. Got it right. Thank you. OK. Uh, um, all right. Um, so uh, uh, Mike, I mean, uh, uh, so for, for everybody, I want to point out that what uh, Julian James is saying is that it's not evolutionary, but it is cultural. So that, that's a very big distinction uh, and that uh, needs to be made. Um, all right, uh, let's see who's next. Give me just a second here. Uh, next is going to be Francoise, Madeline and Laura. Francoise. Okay, um, so my question is about the, the second feature and uh, the introception uh, which from what I understand is linked to the perception, the, the visual, uh, the olfactive, uh, uh, the audio perception, or even perception from uh, body parts, you know, like, uh, and it, it's represented by language, like when you, you love from all your heart, or I have a tendency to follow my gut's feeling. So is there any scientific uh, proof, connection, between the, the language of using those, those perception or it's not linked at all to any science? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the connection you're making uh, between language and introception, uh, but just to clarify, uh, introception is a, for lack of a better term, quasi-perceptual semi-hallucinatory experience. And uh, it allows us to manipulate uh, mental imagery. So, um, uh, you, you know, you, uh, just let me ask, um, could, could you clarify the, the connection well, with language? I'm talking of language like when you say, you know, my gut's feelings tell me that this person is good or bad. Or right. within language, depending on the language itself, you know, like in French, when you don't like somebody, you say, I cannot smell him, right. you know, instead of stand him. So you use your, your perception of smell to say that you don't like somebody. And that's really a, a, a conscient, uh, consciousness feeling. So is there scientific uh, background to that? Or it's just the words and it doesn't mean it. nothing well, scientific. Yeah, so yeah, I would say there's no such thing as just words. And it seems to me, one of the things you're talking about is metaphors, using metaphoric expressions to describe how we feel. And uh, of course, there's a tremendous literature on metaphors. Uh, and of course, James talked a lot about uh, metaphors. 
um, so yes, there, there's definitely uh, a connection. And sometimes we have a physical sensation, but we don't, we, we don't come up with the words immediately to describe. We don't know how to articulate or verbalize that sensation. Um, and so often we rely on metaphors. And if enough people keep using the same metaphor over and over, then it just becomes a common expression. Um, but we're, we, we're really uh, swimming in the sea of metaphors when it comes to explaining uh, how we feel and how we think. All right, uh, last two questions from Madeline and Laura. Madeline. Yes, uh, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Srikant. Once again, this has been fascinating. I was fortunate enough to be in the breakout room with Brian and he clarified some things for me um, about the timeline of the breakdown of the bicameral mind and the, some of the objections I'd been having about whether or not uh, what you two are talking about is, um, is a form of human exceptionalism that uh, makes us superior. So that was quite interesting and I appreciated it. I just wanted to address um, the two things that Jeff uh, had talked about and what Jyoti um, has talked about at some of these meetups, which were uh, the nature of the questions that we ask ourselves when we're self-examining and where they come from. Um, and what Brian said about um, self-deception and just how easy it is that, um, like I find if all the time that I spent sort of examining myself on my own, I would get into these long, long thought loops um, that really didn't get me anywhere except for more self-criticism. And the only way I really broke out of it was to get involved with other people and talk with them about these things. Um, whether, and whether you, Brian talks about it in the context of therapy, uh, Jyoti has talked about it in the context of getting involved with your local community. Um, but however you do it, getting that feedback from other people, even just hearing how they ask their own questions about themselves can be so valuable. And I'm finding that um, with the groups here that Srikant is running, that I'm getting so much more out of them by participating in the groups than I would ever have gotten just by reading the papers and thinking about them on my own. And it's almost like, I think of it as like a big room that I think of as Srikant's big project. And that room has many, many pathways to it and many doorways. And the different types of, of groups that he has going are all entryways into this room where we kind of um, discuss things in our mental space, but also in this community space that forms. Um, that I have, I've learned so much more from being in the room with other people than I would have ever learned by being in the room, uh, just doing the reading by myself. So uh, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Madeline. Really appreciate uh, that. Um, so I'd say a couple of things. What happens is, I mean, one of the observations that Brian made last time is that it's by seeing the mental, like children learn that there is mental space in other people first, and then they get the idea of their own mental space. Similarly, hmm. your ability to conceptualize your life becomes better and better when you actually communicate with other people because you are actually going between two multiple mental spaces. And what we have here, like for example, when you're writing something down or when we are speaking something, you're actually like you're actually building a map. Another way of looking at it, this is like a map or a simulation that you're building on your own. But when you're sharing a map and correcting the map with other people, that is a much more robust feedback mechanism for you to get to the territory because these are all maps, right? I mean, they are maps or these are simulations to guide your life. And this is a, and talking to other people is actually a very cheap way of getting, getting the feedback because otherwise, what is the option? You're going to do stuff in life and you're going to get, you're, you are going to get feedback from life. OK, but here you talk to people and say, uh oh, looks like I'm screwing up over here. I really don't have any good reasons for that. So it is very powerful. And 
I mean, the whole thing that I've tried to create here, the first in New York in in-person meetups and here, is that I do think that this discussion is really, really good for people. You know, like Carl Rogers' idea of authentic relating is a very fundamental idea because each of us have their, our own biases and own, you know, own kind of limitations, which are not fully, they are not reasonable. There are lots of presumptions we have, lots of habits we have. And if you're actually talking to someone and listening to somebody, it gives you an ability. It, it, you have a chance to correct yourself um, and it's mutual. So I, I think it's great. So th thank you, thank you for those observations. Um, so Brian will be back next Sunday. Uh, so uh, coming Sunday at 5 p.m. And we'll be doing a second version. We are going to keep building on this book. This is a you know really powerful, I mean, I'm very excited about this particular book. He's written, I think, 17 books. This is the book I'm most excited about because it is about applying Julian Jane's ideas to your life. The second thing is that the meetups that we are doing Sundays that start that tomorrow, we are going into this book, which has been produced by the Center for the Study of Digital Life. It is one of the most profound things. So if you think Julian Jaynes is great, and I do think Julian Jaynes is great, what these people have done is that they have taken in full J Julian Jaynes. They have connected it to people like Marshall McLuhan, um, Merlin Donald, who see the effect of who, who look at technologies, different technologies, like the oral technology, the written technology, the print technology, the television technology, the digital technology, the social media, and they work out the implications of Julian Jane's ideas across all these media, okay? So they go forward like that. They also go backwards. So they look at people like Aristotle and Aquinas, and look at the views of human psychology and human faculties that are there. So that's what we're doing. We're starting the book tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Uh, this is a meetup. So just go ahead at 12 p.m. Eastern time. I strongly recommend it. I also strongly recommend that you read the paper. It's a 16 page paper. Uh, it's very complex. So try to read it if you can. Otherwise, you know, we will we'll talk about it. We'll, I, you know, I'm committed to try to make all the ideas that we discuss accessible to everybody. So are we going to do that? But um, Brian, thank you very much. It's always thank an you. honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Same here. Th thank you for the questions from everybody. Really, very good questions. Fascinating. Yes, and we, we are going to continue this. You know, we are going to, uh, you know, keep building on these ideas. So. Um, I strongly recommend that you read uh, Julian Jaynes yourself, The Origins of uh, Origin of Consciousness, and um, and come back, uh, and we'll we'll keep doing this week after week until we get these ideas, you know, completely internalized. All right, thank you very much, Brian. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, bye, everybody. <laughs>